about a mighty samurai warrior and a small monk. One day this mighty warrior walked up to the monk and he demanded, Monk, teach me of heaven and hell. And this small monk looked back at this mighty warrior and he said, Teach you? I can't teach you. You're stupid. <laughs> and besides that, you stink. You're dirty. You're filthy. Your sword is rusty. You are a disgrace to the samurai class. I couldn't possibly teach you anything. You are so disgusting. And this mighty warrior is filled with rage. And he pulled out his sword and he got ready to end this little monk's life right before him. He pulled out that sword and he was ready. And the little monk looked at him and he said, That is hell. At first, the warrior didn't get it. But then it sunk in. And he realized that this little man had risked his life to demonstrate for him a principle. And his heart cry cracked wide open. And he had compassion and appreciation for this little monk. He had a caring for him. And it was in that moment that he was filled. And he fell to his knees and the tears came down his cheeks. And he said, thank you, wise monk. And the monk said, and that is heaven. Well, welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming out this morning on this beautiful Alaska springtime day. Springtime in Alaska. Oh, my. Springtime. <laughs> springtime. Thank you. Thank you for coming out. Welcome to the Alaska Center for Spiritual Living. Nearly every religious tradition has held that the heart is the seat of love within each and every one of us. The heart is the seat of wisdom. In New Thought, our movement, what we believe, we believe much the same thing. And it took me just a few moments to find a whole host of quotations. Maya Angelou said, the heart is the most forceful, impactful element in our lives. Eckhart Tolle said, The power of the heart is to be connected with who you are at the deepest level. Paulo Coelho of the Camino fame said, You will never ever reach your full potential if you do not open your heart. Jane Goodall, We think of the heart in the poetic sense, the seat of love and compassion, and it is this heart that is terribly important. Gary Zukoff, the higher order of logic and understanding originates in your heart. Again, the higher order of, of uh, understanding and logic originates in the heart. He goes on to say at a different time, Divine intelligence is within your heart. You will not find your soul in your intellect. And finally, Ernest Holmes. We couldn't go on without Ernie. <laughs> Ernest Holmes said, Everything is governed by law. The law is written in our own hearts. And we are governed by law. Follow your heart. And the power of infinite law and love will carry you through all of your life. So I think we can agree that most sages, most mystics throughout all of the ages have held of the importance of our heart. My three points today are thought plus feeling equals manifestation. Then I've got, I'm going to talk a little bit about an experiment from the HeartMath Institute and finally I'm going to talk about heart intelligence. Thought 
plus feeling equals manifestation. It's one of the basic things that we believe in. We believe in the power of our minds. We believe that our thoughts are creative. And we believe that when we pray for others, if we know a spiritual truth for them, that we can manifest that good in their lives. And we do so with this idea that our thoughts are powerful and that thought coupled with feeling will produce an outward tangible outcome in, in the real, in the touchable world. A, an amazing couple, um, Sandra and David Chesterman, lost their 21-year-old daughter in a, in a terrible car wreck. It was a drunk driver uh, killed their beautiful 21-year-old daughter who was a nursing student. David had retired a couple of years earlier and he had wondered what he could or would do with his time. He wanted to make a difference in the world, but he didn't know what to do. And after his daughter was killed, he had that idea. He had the original thought that he wanted to make a difference in the world and after his daughter died, he had the feeling, he had the heart to couple with that, to bring his idea into manifestation. And his idea was to create a, uh, a nonprofit that would help people get adequate health care. Everybody would be able to get health care. About three weeks after his daughter had been killed, he and his wife were in her apartment. It was only a half a block from the place where she was killed. She'd been at the library studying and she was on her way home and was within a half a block of her apartment. And you could see the place where she was killed from her apartment. They were there cleaning up her stuff and gathering her belongings and whatnot. And mom was going through some stuff and she came across what she discovered was her daughter's bucket list the things that she wanted to do. And it was filled with some just amazing things. She wanted to, she wanted to fly a plane. She wanted to skydive. <coughs> she wanted to be in four states at once. And this was a long, long list of things. And mom thought of it and she realized that her daughter uh, Christina would never be able to be in, you know, at Four Corners where Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona, and Utah come together and people go there and stand and they put themselves in four states at once. She would not be able to do that, but she'd been able to do it on a bigger scale because what she had done is one of her requests, one of her things in her life was she wanted her organs donated and so many of her organs came through this horrific uh, uh, car uh, wreck that she was able to donate so many of her organs and she realized that these uh, recipients of her organs were in many different states and so she knew that even that on her bucket list had been filled that she was indeed in more than four states at once. It was unique. Her heart had been donated to a lady not far from where they lived. And uh, one night she got a phone call from her son who said, Mom, you got to check out your Facebook page. And there on her Facebook page was a message from a lady. Her name was Susan. And she said, I'm pretty sure I, that I have your daughter Christina's heart. And Susan did indeed have that heart. Uh, Sandra, Christina's mom, even though it was late at night, picked up the phone and called her right then and there. And they had an immediate connection. They immediately bonded and they talked. And um, 
they agreed to meet and they realized how much they had in common. And at one of their meetings, they went through the bucket list. And oh my. Oh, the, uh, one of the things in her bucket list is she, she wanted to uh, fly a plane. Susan replied, I'm a pilot. Oh, she said, well, she always wanted to skydive. I've skydived. She went through that bucket list. And this 64-year-old retired nurse had done so many things on that bucket list. She hadn't been in four states at once. But she had done so many things on the bucket list. It's almost as if uh, Christina had willed or known in advance to whom her heart should go. <coughs> but David started the nonprofit, and it was for the purpose of advancing health care for everyone. And so they did things like they have a, uh, a scholarship fund for beginning nurses to help nurses financially attend nursing school. It, they have uh, donations. They have made all types of contributions. And it, it's called the um, uh, Christina Chesterman Memorial, KCM. Um, and it began with this idea. It began with a thought when it was back with, with feeling, and now it has come into fruition, and it's a, a profitable going nonprofit. Thought plus feeling equals manifestation, and that feeling is what comes from our heart. That's what Holmes was talking about, is that heart feeling. Next, I'm going to talk about an experiment done by the HeartMath Institute. Uh, I've talked about them before. They study the, the human heart and how it works and what it does. They have a lot of work on the human heart. One of the experiments that they did was to expose the subjects to different pictures. And they had what they classified as high arousal pictures. And these were things like... Uh, picture of a snake getting ready to strike, or a uh, horrific car crash, or um, a charging uh, brown bear, you know, something that would uh, initiate a fight or flight uh, response from the person who viewed that. It was a, um, a high emotional type of a, of a picture. Uh, and then the other pictures were very calming. They were things like, a bunny rabbit, or uh, a placid pond with a rowboat in it, or a, a mountain scene, or a kitten, or a puppy. They were all very calming, calming pictures. And they had their test subjects all wired up. They looked like human porcupines with all these electrodes out of them, and they would expose the people to them, and they would measure all of these different things within them. They would measure their um, well, the galvanic skin response and all of the electrical things that go on within the, the body, the magnetic uh, systems and the electrical systems within the human body, and they would look at those, analyze them, and for simplicity's sake today, I'm only going to talk about one, and that's heart rate. But they had noticed that when people saw the high arousal pictures, their heart rate dropped. When they saw the placid, serene, calming pictures, they did not. They were able to measure these things. They continued to expose the subjects to this, and they came up with a variation of this experiment, and the subject would uh, click on a mouse, and that would initiate the process, and there would be a delay. I think the initial one they did was like 10 seconds. And then the picture would come up. The picture was computer generated. It was random generation. But what they found next is what surprised them. Because the, the subject would click. And five seconds go by, and the subject's physiological makeup would change. It, 
in this case I'm using the heart rate, the heart rate would drop before the high arousal picture was shown. The heart rate would drop before the computer made the selection of what kind of picture they were going to see. The heart knew before the event even happened. There is something within us that knows, and that something resides in our heart. What is the source of this inner intuition? It must be in the heart. Roland McCarty of the Heart, Health, Heart Math Institute said, the heart is connected by a type of intuition that is not bound by time or space. There's something within us that knows. And how do we tap into that? Yesterday we had, we call it a practitioner deepening. We get together uh, every month and sometimes we do business I don't know how much business we do, but we say we do. Uh, and other times we have what we call deepening. Uh, and yesterday was one of our deepenings, and, and we talked about this concept. And the practitioners were full of these things. Uh, Karen shared one. Well, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Karen shared one that was, that was really uh, made an impact on me. She was younger than I assume, riding, she was on a motorcycle with her brother. Uh, it was back east and they were coming to off ramp off of a highway and she just got it, that intuition, that knowing, slow down, slow down, they need to slow down. You know, her heart rate was up and going and she squeezed her brother and she said, slow down, slow down. They slowed down and as they did, they came around the corner and there was an 18 wheeler over on its side. But they had slowed down. She listened to that intuition. Robert shared one too. Uh, he was down on the uh, Kenai Peninsula, I believe, and uh, he saw a car approaching, you know, it was a, a T intersection, and he could just tell there was something wrong. And he slow, slow, slowed down, and this car that came through the intersection, the T, didn't stop, didn't do anything, and ended up running the car in front of him uh, off into the ditch, and nobody was hurt or anything. But Robert sensed that in, a, in advance. He could tell that there was something wrong with the driver of that other car. So we have these things in our lives all the time. It's the origin is our heart. The third thing I'm going to talk about is heart intelligence. There are over one, excuse me, over 40,000 specialized cells in our heart. These are essentially brain cells, but they're located in our heart. They're called sensory neurites. They are centered and focused in one area of the heart. They're concentrated in this one area of the heart. And some scientists call it the little brain of the heart. Well, the heart brain can learn independently of the brain. The heart brain can think independently of the human brain. The heart brain can remember independently of our brain. Scientists have, and doctors have known this for a long, long time, particularly in um, heart uh, uh, recipients and heart donors they found that there was an amazing number of uh, recipients of donated hearts that developed a strange craving for food, a particular food. And they, didn't, could, they couldn't explain that until they found out that this craving for a specific food was the favorite food of the donor. That heart remembered what its favorite food was. the heart brain can communicate independently from our brain. This allows our body to respond much faster. There is no judgment. There is no shame. There isn't all the other stuff that we carry around. All of the false beliefs aren't there. They're only in the upper brain. So it allows our body to react instantly. 
We don't have to go through all that other stuff. So how do we access this heart brain? How do we tap into this intuition? How do we pull this into our lives and how do we use this on a, on a daily or, or weekly basis? Well, once again, the Heart Brain Institute or the Heart Math Institute has come up with a, an exercise to do this. And this is nothing that they came up with. This procedure is centuries and centuries old. It is, and it is not unique to Western medicine, Eastern medicine, to philosophy, to religion, or anything else. This is a very ancient process, and it's been around a long time. They now know what it does is it creates a coherence, a coherence between our head brain and our heart brain of 0.1 hertz. So we're going to do it. We're all going to have a little exercise. We'll have a little fun. So I ask you to settle into your chair. You can put your feet on the floor. Close your eyes if you're comfortable doing so. Hmm. I want you to shift your focus from your brain to your heart. Shift your attention from your brain to your heart. And the way we're going to do that is by touching our heart. And you can do this any number of ways. You can put a single finger on it. You can use an open palm. You can do a prayer mudra. What I found, what works for me, is I just take three fingers and I put it in that little indentation right above your sternum, right over your heart. And then just shift the focus from the brain to the heart. And now slow your breathing. Just slow it down. It doesn't have to be deeper. Just slow the breathing down. Take as long as five seconds for an inhale. Five seconds for an exhale. What they found is this awakens a healing chemistry within our bodies. It awakens our immune system. The other time that we feel this is when we're safe. We feel a great amount of safety. I think this goes back to caveman. When a caveman knew he wasn't going to be attacked by a saber-toothed tiger, he was able to slow down his breathing. And the third step is to create a feeling in your heart. A feeling in your heart. Select from one of the following four emotions or feelings. First is caring. A deep caring for someone else. Or an appreciation. An appreciation for someone or something. Third option is gratitude. Just being grateful. Grateful for, for all that is. Grateful for people you know. Grateful for situations. Grateful to be in a place where you do feel safe. Gratitude. Or the fourth choice would be compassion. A feeling of compassion. Compassion for yourself. Compassion for others. So select one of those feelings and just feel that in your heart. Right now I have a feeling of deep caring. Deep, deep caring for someone I love so dearly. And so now in this we have produced that coherence. And the coherence stays with us even though we may take our hand away from our heart, even though we may return our focus to this room at this time, that 
coherence will stay with us for up to six hours. And it is in that that we can tap into the power of our heart. So I invite you to try that. Uh, Rollin McCarty had the quote about the heart connected by intuition that's not bound by time or space. Talked about how he will do that three or four times a day, reground with that. So my final takeaway today comes from a quote from Lao Tzu. <coughs> Lao Tzu once said, I have but three things to teach you. Simplicity, patience, and compassion. And I thought about that and I wonder what does he mean by those? And I think simplicity refers to direct living. First-hand living, first-hand experiences in life, touching life directly. Patience, I think patience. Patience restores us to wholeheartedness. The urgencies we feel are mostly false. I had this demonstrated. My granddaughter, I was talking with her, and we were on schedule to be late and I don't like being late and I was probably urging her along and uh, she said grandpa she said chill she said are you safe I said yes I'm safe well are you bleeding no I am not bleeding are you breathing Yes, I am breathing. Then it's not that important. <laughs> Nine. <laughs> Out of the mouths of babes. Compassion is to be with, to keep honest company. If you're there to problem solve the pain, then you're not truly with someone. Compassion is to be there and be with someone. If you do not open your heart, then existence will crush you. Simplicity, patience, and compassion. In an age where we run from the depths of feeling and the teachings of the heart, our fear can reframe simplicity as stupidity, patience as laziness, and compassion as sentimentality, and make them not worthwhile to pick up. So what I urge you today is to be like the samurai warrior. Learn the lessons of the heart. And so it is with that awareness of the power of our heart that I invite my colleagues, the practitioners, to, to join me in prayer for our congregation, for each and every person. And it is this prayer, this prayer that is that combination of thought and feeling that produces a manifestation. It is a prayer of absolute knowing that whatever confronts us in this earthly plane, that there is a higher ground, that there is a spiritual truth behind it. And there is an absolute feeling, a feeling from the heart, an intuition, a knowingness that comes only from our heart that knows this to be the case. And so I speak my word for each and every person who is experiencing lack and limitation, the appearance of not enoughness. We just know that we live in an abundant universe, a universe that supplies every need. And 
we just open ourselves up to that good. And for those who cannot see that, we can know that for them through the one universal mind. We know we live in an abundant universe. For those that are experiencing health challenges, we know that within each of us, there is a blueprint that is perfect, a pattern of perfection, and it's that perfection that we embrace in this moment. And with that deep heart feeling, we know that the highest good is unfolding right now. The patient is healed. The patient may die, but the patient is healed. And we absolutely know, for those of us that experience separation in this moment, separation from one another, separation from God, we know in our hearts that we are one, that the love that we share is now and always will be, and it can never be destroyed. And so we just now allow that heart space, that heart wisdom, that heart intelligence to go with our words and make manifest the highest good for each and every one of us. And so we just simply let it go, we let it be, and so it is. So it is.